so I'm just going to reintroduce the event for anyone that joined a little late. So hello everyone, everyone and welcome to this event aimed at young people interested in knowing more about the habitats protected in the UK. So I'm Naomi, I'm part of the Arbright Future Youth Forum as a youth representative. Lawrence is also going to be helping me out at the end of the event for the Q&A. Lawrence is also an Arbright Future Youth Forum rep who sits on Arbright Future's steering group. So any of the organisations that you're interested in tonight, please feel free to follow them after the event if you're not already doing so. So I'm just going to introduce the speakers for this session. So we've got Rosie Snowden, who's from the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust and is a P Pete's project manager. We've also got Nia Jones, who is um, the Living Seas Manager for, North, for the North Wales Wildlife Trust, Lizzie Pinkerton, for the, who is the Manager for Belfast Hills Partnership, and Mary Ann Collins, who's part of the Scottish Wildlife Trust and is a Conservation Officer. So I'd just like to say thank you for all the professionals who volunteered to support this webinar and talk about the work they do on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm just going to pass you on to our sp first speaker, Rosie. Thanks, Naomi. I'm not sure about professional, but I'll uh, try and be as professional as possible. Um, so hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Rosie and I am a projects manager for the Yorkshire Peak Partnership. Um, I'm part of a wider team, as you can see there. Um, there's 12 of us in total. Um, we've got the restoration team, the um, data and monitoring team who also use drones as you can see there and uh, we usually have a trainee as well. Um, so Yorkshire Peak Partnership is um, a project that's hosted by Yorkshire Wildlife Trust um, but we work with lots of other organisations so the National Trust, the Environment Agency, Yorkshire Water, other wildlife trusts, um, mainly within Yorkshire but also outside um, with wider wider partners as well. Um, we've been going about 11 years and the overall aim is to basically restore all of the blanket bog in Yorkshire and we're just under halfway there so probably another 10 years to go. Next slide please. So um, we're Yorkshire peat partnership but we mainly focus on blanket bog which is a habitat um, comprised of peat. It's a type of peatland. There's various different kinds. Um, this one forms um, in the hills where it's wet, uh, it's rainy, it's cold. Um, so Yorkshire Dales and the northwest of England, and Scotland and Ireland and Wales. So it's all in the everywhere over the UK. Um, it's very nutrient poor and all of these different wet and cool conditions um, provide the perfect habitat for sphagnum moss which is that red moss you can see there. Um, it's This is the uh, star of peatlands, um, it, peatlands wouldn't be peat without it um, and this, this forms all of the right conditions for peat to form. So all of the plants you can see in that picture they don't decompose, they um, just layer upon layer, a bit like how coal forms um, turn into peat. So it's a very slow process and uh, can take uh, a year to form a centimetre of peat. Um, so blanket bog has, and all peatlands in general, have um, lots of different benefits to wider society and to the climate um, and lots of um, really helpful things that we just don't really know about. So because of how the peat forms, um, the plants take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and because they don't decompose, that carbon is then locked away into the ground forever and ever. Um, the vegetation up there slows the flow of water off um, the hills so it prevent or um, reduces the flashiness of flooding downstream. Um, the plants up there and the mosses also filter the water that goes down into the rivers so um, water companies don't have to uh, clean the water quite so much and it's also um, a home for many different species, um, many of them rare as well and only live in these places so we've got um, 
a golden plover there. We've got a short-eared owl, a common lizard, and then some plants. We've got bilberry, with which you can eat, a useful snack when we're out surveying. Um, and personal favourite, the um, carnivorous sundew, so that um, eats insects. So it's a delicate balance up there. Um, the the habitat is incredibly um, vulnerable to change. Um, so hu many human impacts can cause the um, habitat to become unbalanced. Um, so things like drainage, um, fires, all causing um, the peat to dry out. And as soon as you get a drop in the water table, the um, the sphagnum moss, so that key species, um, it starts to die and then you get these huge erosion gullies forming, vast areas of bare exposed peat and then that has all the opposite consequences of all those benefits I just said. So flooding increases, those greenhouse gases that were locked away are now being emitted into the atmosphere, um, negatively changing the climate. Um, so they've gone from having all these wonderful benefits to doing the complete opposite. Um, and that's where we come in. So um, Yorkshire Peak Partnership, we come and block the drains, we make it wetter again, and we try and put some of those specialised species back in. Um, and then just quickly, what you can do to help, um, well, spread the word. There are very little known um, Habitat. I, I've no idea if you guys have heard about them before. Um, so spread the word. Peat should be in the ground. So in um, all across Europe, it's dug up in huge, terrifying quantities for compost for the gardening um, industry. Um, so yeah, encourage people to go buy peat-free compost. And um, yeah, if you want to find out more, uh, I think Lydia's going to send around some links after. So I've no idea if I was going too fast. So um, hopefully you understood a bit of what I was saying. But yeah, looking forward to questions. Thanks, Rosie. I thought it was great that you included a little bit about like what we can do in response to what you said. And I'm also from Yorkshire, so it's applicable to me. Um, I'll pass you on to our next speaker, Nia. Hi, yeah. So I'm Nia. I'm the Living Seas Manager at North Wales Wildlife Trust. Um, I've been working at the Trust since 2007. Um, and my role is to develop sort of marine conservation projects um, in North Wales. We, we do have 36 nature reserves on land and living landscapes, but we're lucky enough to have a few hundred kilometres of coastline as well. Um, and the project that I'm working on at the moment is called Living Seas Wales. So we go the next slide, please. Um, and Living Seas Wales is a project that we're doing in partnership with the Wildlife Trust of South and West Wales. So if you look at this map, we've got North Wales uh, at the top and Wildlife Trust of South and West Wales at the bottom there. And um, between us, we cover the whole, pretty much the whole coast of Wales, apart from um, a little bit um, to, the, to the east of Cardiff. Um, and our project is really aimed at getting people out and about onto the coast, inspired about marine wildlife, um, but also um, feeling enabled enough to take action. So we do a lot of training with volunteers and courses um, and things like that. And we also went to the past, we looked to the past. So we had an element of the project which we were collecting stories and memories, trying to look at how um, the seas of Wales has changed over time. Um, and our seas are important. Here in Wales, we've got about 15,000 kilometres square of sea area. So we've got just as much sea as we have of land. Um, our seas regulate the climate. Um, it gives us a lot, you know, one in four of the breaths we take is oxygen produced by marine habitats. Um, and, and it's about 60% of the Welsh population live around the coast. So our seas influence our everyday life. Um, but one of the biggest threats um, that I think anyway, um, for our marine life is the fact that people just don't know what's there. Um, you know, you can, you can quite often go to the beach and you look out and you just sort of see the flat sea, but underneath our sort of marine habitats are just as 
varied as that of land and these are some of the statistics that that we found that kind of made us come up with these projects which really try and get people out and about and knowing what's there one percent can name a living element of a real undersea landscape 44 percent of respondents think that um that our undersea landscapes are utterly generally or mostly barren and this is totally not true and Jackie Cousteau said people protect what they love so how can we expect people to do something about marine conservation if they don't know it's there in the first place um, and next slide please um, and all of these pictures are taken in the seas around um, the UK. Um, so our undersea life is incredible and hugely diverse, hugely colourful. Um, you know, from the tiniest of um, the sea slugs, which are the sort of second row up, the bright orange thing about the size of your fingernail to the sort of giants of our seas. So we have, you know, we have the second biggest whale um, on earth, you know, we get found in our waters, the fin whale, and um, we've got dolphins and uh, crabs and sea squirts, all sorts of weird and wonderful wildlife that, you know, you would be you know, be forgiven thinking that this is these pictures taken around the tropics, but um, our seas are incredible. Um, next slide, please. Um, and unfortunately, um, our project is starting to come to an end now, but we will be continuing the project and this will be looking at a spe specific habitat. So we, we're turning our sort of attention to seagrass. So seagrass is actually the only flowering plant um, in the sea. So um, although, you know, we say seaweeds are plants, they're not actually plants, they're algae and they don't have a root system. So seagrass have roots, they have seeds and they have flowers. And these are incredible, incredible habitats that have, that are nursing grounds for all sorts of species. Um, loads of creatures live on there. Um, it, it's also a really important um, for fighting this sort of climate crisis that we have because they store carbon. Um, you know, the same as the peatlands, they store carbon. Um, but unfortunately, um, we've lost about an estimated 92% of seagrass habitats around the UK. So these are massive, massive losses. Um, and um, so, yeah, please keep an eye out. You might hear some more about seagrasses and uh, quite a few um, wildlife trusts throughout the UK are taking part in um, doing seagrass restoration projects just because they're such important habitats. Um, and next slide, please. Um, but you don't need coastline um, to sort of save save our seas from anywhere and everywhere. And this is a campaign we ran last summer. Um, just because you might, you know, you might live in the centre centre of the UK but there's stuff that you can do to um, save our seas um, so the first thing is create a smart shopping list to have a think about what you're um, buying next slide um, and find out about things and share it with others I think this is an incredibly important thing find out some um, some species ha um, our habitat information and share it share your inspiration next slide Cut your carbon footprint. Um, so we all know that, you know, this carbon is a problem. Um, so get on your bike, start walking. Um, next one. Do local, local litter picks. You don't have to do um, litter picks at the beach um, to help protect our seas because every river ends up in the sea. So a lot of our litter um, thrown inland ends up in the sea. Next slide. Consider chemicals. Think about your, um, you know, your, your, the stuff that you use every day in your home. Next slide. Reduce waste. Um, you know, really try and think about how much stuff that you're using, because like I say, these end up in landfills or getting um, shipped to other places as well as, you know, even some of our recycling don't end up being recycled. Next slide. Um, upcycle, get creative, do things with the waste um, if you have any waste um, producing. And the last one is my favourite, is spark a change. Um, do what you can to get people involved um, and not just in sort of marine wildlife, in any kind of wildlife and environmental issues. And that's me. Thank you. Um, I really like the use of images at the start. I really like visualises the diverse wildlife. So I'm going to pass you on to Lizzie, our next speaker. Thank you. Hey, great. Well, fantastic to be here. My name's Lizzie Pinkerton and I work for the Belfast Hills Partnership. Um, next slide, please. 
So I have been there for just over 16 years now, strangely enough, it's scary where the time goes. So I'm not sure if any of you here are from Northern Ireland or have been to Northern Ireland, but if you've ever been to Belfast, which is the sort of capital city, and basically anywhere in the city, you look up through all the, the different streets, you'll see little hints of the hills behind. So there's a big line of hills that run all the way across the skyline of the city. So we were set up to help look after it. And as the name suggests, we're a partnership organization. We work with not just local nature conservation charities, but with local businesses, local community groups, local farmers, um, different recreation groups, a really exciting mix of everyone. Um, next slide, please. Fantastic. So, um, we, uh, I was asked to look today at quarries and cliffs of the Belfast Hills. So we're really quite a special landscape in terms of that we have so many. Some are natural cliffs and some are created um, through quarrying that's happened in the past. So on the right hand side of the screen, you can see a, a map of the different habitats of the Belfast Hills. And in bright red, you'll see the active quarries. So you can see actually there's loads of quarries that are still active here, just beside, and the dark gray there is the urban city of Belfast. So it's quite unusual to have so many quarries beside such a huge urban expanse. And that's very reflective of all the different quarrying activities that's happened over the years. So they're the, the current ones, but actually all through time um, that people have from early man, the Stone Age um, mine and flints from the Belfast Hills to Victorian era, where it's all about the limestone, um, which was made new for buildings and for putting on the land and such. So today's quarries are very much basalt. So if you're ever in Northern Ireland, most of the roads that you drive on actually have come from the Belfast Hills. Um, and so we have a, a very interesting mix of quarry holes left and some of the quarry holes are getting filled up with waste. It's a natural thing that if you have a, a large hole then uh, you use it for landfill too. So these are some of the partners who actually we work with. Um, so next slide please. Um, so one of the sites that is very iconic within the Belfast Hills is that of Cave Hill Country Park. Um, so for those who, who haven't been there before, the main picture here is um, the cliff edges, natural cliff edges from the, the Cave Hill, and these are very much basalt. So if you can see my arrow key, you can see here, there's a little tiny person standing there in the mouth of the cave. So there's actually seven caves here on the, the side of the, the hill, um, most of which you um, you can't really see in the picture, but the one the person standing in is one of the biggest. Um, so that's how the, the mountain there gets its name. On the left hand side of the screen is the limestone quarry. And so it's also within Cave Hill Country Park and it was, as the name suggests, an old limestone quarry from the Victorian age and it's now very much a habitat for wildlife and nature. So let's pop around one. Okay, so why is this important? Why, why do we care about these quarries and cliffs? When you think about a quarry activity, you think just lots of piles of stone and no nature and no wildlife, but actually they create such wonderful habitats. So if I start on the, the bottom right, um, this is within one of the active quarries that are within the Belfast Hills. It just looks like a, a, a bank here, but actually if you look carefully at the top of it, there's lots and lots of little holes. They are sand martin nests, and so the sand martins are just merrily getting on with life in the middle of an active quarry. The picture at the top um, is a quarry that's no longer used and you see often quarries end up getting filled at the base with water and they create these wonderful pools which attract all sorts of species, very much the dragonflies and the damselflies but then a lot of um, birds and all sorts of things go on, so really exciting places. Our quarry edges are also fantastic places for a lot of wildflowers. So the middle pictures, you can see some of the um, the orchids, the oxide daisies, the um, ragged robins, loads of different flowers that we get within the quarries. And because of that, we actually get loads of different butterflies and moths all throughout them. And then perhaps what you'd maybe more normally associate a quarry with, we have a lots of birds of prey. So the picture here on the, the top left is a peregrine falcon. And actually we find, we, we get more of them nested in the active um, quarry sites than we do in the public sites. Um, and actually they find that they are less disturbed by an active um, quarry than they are by the public sites where the members of the public are just all over the place. And the very other bottom picture is the common lizard. 
Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Ireland, we are supposed to not have any snakes, lizards or anything else. St. Patrick was supposed to have got rid of them all, but actually he overlooked the common lizard. And we are very pleased that within a lot of our different quarry sites, there are common lizards that uh, like to bask on the, on the rocks. Are you want to bop her on, please? So what can I do to help? Well, obviously by the nature of a lot of quarries, you can't just be wandering in by yourself. Uh, we're very fortunate that we've worked with a huge number of different private quarry owners across the Belfast Hills as part of the Arbright Future Scheme. So all the pictures you see here are young people who have helped us help the um, wildlife within the, the quarries in the Belfast Hills. So the first most common thing you often think about is tree planting. And we have done loads of that. We've planted thousands of trees. And um, so the, the bottom left picture is a bit obscured by the one on top, but that's one of the shale banks in the quarry. And actually we've planted out loads and loads of trees on it. So in the future, instead of looking up and seeing um, shale, um, you'll actually see a wonderful forest, which again, when we're talking about fighting climate change and making a difference, it's going to make a brilliant difference in the future. We've also done lots of wildflower planting in some of the quarries. Um, there's a picture there of um, people with all their secateurs and loppers. We were doing some clearance of scrub. Apologies, an airplane has just gone past my head. So that is the weird noise that you're hearing. I'm on a flight path here. And this last while you've hardly got a single plane go past. So typically the one night I decide to sit out in the garden and do a talk, I get an airplane. Um, so yep. So we've been clearing bits and bobs of scrub in some of the quarries and um, particularly where we know that the common lizard is to try and create little areas for them to bask. Um, and we also did a wee bit of experimentation with transplanting of heather plants trying to create upland heath on areas that have been capped um, when they've been used for landfill and then um, capped afterwards. So I think basically um, Wherever you are, if you're interested in that kind of thing, get in touch with your local wildlife trust, your local conservation organization and say, look, what are you doing? Are you working with local businesses? How can I get involved? And um, give us an example. Oh, you know that this quarry was doing that. And often a lot of quarries are very keen to get really good publicity that actually they have a lot of negative press and um, they're often excited to, to get involved in these things. For both positive publicity, but actually we've found some of the guys, the quarry workers themselves, and have become so interested. And one of the local quarries that we work with have actually um, given us land on their site and we have our own um, tree healing in beds and tree nurseries and stuff that we keep there so we didn't have enough land of ourselves and they are great if it's too hot and sunny they'll come out and water our plants and, and look after things so you never know what little things that you can do that can actually spark a big difference and lead on to other things. Um, so that's me, thanks very much. Thanks Lizzie. I've never heard much about like the Belf Belfast Hills, so it was all quite new, which was interesting. So I'm going to pass you on to our last speaker of the event, um, Mary Ann. Hi everyone, thanks Naomi. Um, so I'm Mary Ann and I'm a conservation officer for Saving Scotland's Red Squirrels. Um, I look after the region that's just north of Glasgow on the map there, and I organise everything in this region, um, including finding out where red and grey squirrels are, the two species we have in the UK. I do some surveys, I help vol get volunteers to help me do surveys, and I engage with local communities to try and help save their local populations. Next please, Lydia. So our project started in 2009 and it's a partnership of six key organisations across Scotland. It's led by the Scottish Wildlife Trust and we've got multiple funders as well and you can see all the little logos on the right hand side there. But why do we actually need to save red squirrels? Um, so they used to be found everywhere as you can see on the map on the left but nowadays the situation is a bit different like the map on the right. Um, there's thought to be about 140,000 individuals left and that's compared to 3 million grey squirrels so it's quite a big difference. Um, and our project, as well as many others across the UK, is designed to try and stop their decline. Um, it's particularly important in Scotland, where we've got about three quarters or 75% of the whole of the UK's red squirrel population. So we're quite lucky, but we really need to save them. Next, please. So red squirrels face quite a lot of threats. It's thought that a squirrel used to be able to cross from one side of Scotland to the other without touching the ground at all, just using tree branches. Unfortunately, they can't do that anymore because we've done a lot of changes in the landscape. Um, we've felled quite a lot of trees and big areas, both for agriculture, farming, um, also for our own buildings, so our urban areas and our houses. 
for the woodland that we do have left, unfortunately, we've also put gaps in that as well for, so that we can get from one side of it to the other. Um, that includes roads and unfortunately, squirrels aren't very good at crossing the road. Um, thankfully, these problems that I've just spoken about, our project partners are helping to do a lot to make sure that people don't drive too fast on roads and give squirrels a bit of a chance to get across. Or we're making sure we do really good forestry practices so we don't cut everything down at once. We're a bit more careful about that sort of thing. So thankfully, they don't cause too many problems anymore. And actually, the main problem is the grey squirrel. Um, and that's what our project focuses on. Next, please. So grey squirrels shouldn't really be here. They're an invasive non-native species. They were brought over from America in the 19th century, and that's by the Victorians who decided to move lots of different things around the world. It's partly because they didn't have phones, they didn't have cameras, so they couldn't take a photo and bring it back. They actually brought the animals or the plants back. And they did this with grey squirrels. They also brought them back as gifts for big estates. In America, grey squirrels have to compete with lots of other different species, including other squirrels. And it means they've become really good at being squirrels and taking over and just getting as many nutrients from different things as possible. So they're really not fussy. They can breed all the time. Um, unfortunately, red squirrels are quite fussy. They never really had to compete with anything else until the grey squirrels came in. So they're fussy eaters. They're really dependent on what foods are around, very delicate kind of balance with the ecosystem. And so it means that grey squirrels have taken over and you can see that a little bit on the maps in the middle there. Um, you can see the greys kind of spreading and then the reds getting smaller and smaller. Unfortunately, grey squirrels also carry a disease that doesn't affect them, but is really lethal to red squirrels. So it means that those squirrels in that area that get that disease, unfortunately, die off and the grey squirrels take over even more and faster. So the best way that we can help is to try and keep the two species apart. And that's what our project and many others across the UK do. We focus on those key areas that are in orange on the map where the two species overlap and then try and reduce the interaction of the two species. Next, please. So there's lots of different things that you can do to help wildlife in our woodlands, and that's not just for squirrels. You can let people know what species you see when you're out walking around in the woods. There's lots of different apps and things that you can use so that you can record what you see. Um, and that helps people planning to do any work either in the woodlands or close to it because then we know what species are there and we can make sure we put things in place so that we don't disturb them too much. We maybe move them so they're out of the way and they're protected a bit more. Lots of different things we can do. With red squirrels this is really important because they're a protected species and in Scotland you can let us know by um, reporting your squirrel both red or grey to our website. Thanks Lydia for sharing that. Um, you can also Follow us on social media, so on Facebook or on Twitter, just to see what's happening in your local area or just if you're intrigued to see what's happening in Scotland. We also share things from elsewhere in the UK as well. Um, there are lots of other different red squirrel projects across the UK and you can report your sightings to them. So UK Squirrel Accord is a really good resource and um, they've got a website also um, probably about to be shared in the chat and you can have a look. There's a tab on their website called Get Involved and it gives you all the different links to all the UK red squirrel groups and projects. Next, please. So when you are out looking for squirrels, it can hard to actually see a squirrel. They can be quite busy, um, especially if you're in really dense woodland. It might be a bit easier to see a grey squirrel in a park. Um, so we have to look for other signs that they're there. So if it's rained or snowed recently, we can look for footprints on the ground. We can also look for signs of how they've been feeding and what they've left behind. Unfortunately, you can't tell the difference between whether it was a red or a grey squirrel that's eaten something, but you can tell whether it's a squirrel or a mouse, for instance. So in the right hand side there, there's a hand and it's got three cones in it. The left and the middle one are ones that have been squirreled. They're really messy. They're not very clean, tidy eaters. And then the one on the right is actually a mouse and it's really nice and neat. So we can tell that squirrels have been there and it's something that we use. We find out if squirrels are in a woodland and then we do better surveys to try and figure out which colour are visiting, for instance. Next, please. So when you're out and about, if you do see signs of feeding, what you can do is you can be a bit like a detective. You can go and kind of stake out that spot in person. Or if you've got permission from the landowner, you could maybe put a wildlife camera up and see who's been visiting. We do have to be quite careful, though, because even though the species look quite different as pictures here, um, they can be quite sneaky and red squirrels can look grey and grey squirrels can look red and they can both look black, white and all sorts of colours, a bit like we have different hair colour. So you can't rely on that alone. Uh, there's a couple of different things you can look out for. So red squirrels are half the size of a grey, but a baby grey squirrel can look a similar size. So you have to be careful on that one too. Um, but they each have a unique feature. So red squirrels have ear tufts, which is extra hair on the top of their ears. Grey squirrels never have that and they have mouse-like ears. And in comparison, grey squirrels have this white 
band of um, hair on the edge of their tails. They always have this and we call it a tail halo and red squirrels never have that. So that's a couple of different things you can keep an eye out for. Um, so please keep a lookout when you're wandering through the woodlands and let people know what you see, particularly squirrels, because it could be quite important. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Marianne. Um, and thank you to all the other speakers for your chat talks. So we're going to move on to a Q&A session now. Uh, Lawrence is going to help me ask the questions. So if you'd like to type any questions you've got into the chat or if you want to raise your hand, that would be great. If you don't have like a question to ask one of the speakers, feel, 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 please feel free to share a campaign or a project or something you do that, would, um, that you'd like to share or you think would be interested in. So let's move on to questions. Okay, so the way this is going to work is that um, I'll be reading, I'll read through the chat for any questions that anyone puts in the chat. If you said you want to jump the queue and you're comfortable asking your own question yourself, um, raise your uh, virtual hand under the participants tab. With like, um, sorry, under the reactions tab, like so. Okay. Right. Well, since I can, I'll uh, ask a question first. Sorry, I've got uh, things going in the background. Ah, I'll ask a question first. Um, I was um, interested by the um, Jacques Cousteau quote about people not being able to um, protect what, uh, well, not being willing to act for what they don't love and don't know and are unaware about. I'd uh, just like to ask the speakers, um, what, how would you go about trying to uh, make people passionate about something that they don't currently care about? Um, shall I start with this one? Um, I think okay. this, is, this has been, we've, um, one thing, you know, is trying to show people um, what's there. And we've been really lucky, you know, as technology is, as you know, you know, got got to where it is because we can see and get these incredible um, videos and photos and footage of underwater life. And even now from from, you know, from the rock pools to to places like the Marinara Trench, which is, you know, 11 kilometers of depth. We've got images of that and it's kind of showing them um, and showing people what's there. But it's also, um, you know, if you can, it's getting people out there to these habitats and to these wild places and um, just experiencing them firsthand, if that's possible is, you know, there's, there's nothing like finding a new habitat. Um, you know, I haven't um, spent, you know, I, I don't know Belfast, Belfast Hills at all, but now I'm kind of inspired and, you know, it's on the list of places to go. So it's, yeah, that, that's why I would say is share, share the knowledge. I'll just jump in quickly. Oh, yeah, you oh, go, Marianne. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd agree with Nia, basically. Um, and what we do, we do a lot of engagement. Like we talk to a lot of people just about what they see in their gardens. And I quite often have conversations that aren't about squirrels, which actually I quite like because I love squirrels. But it's quite nice to talk about other things on occasion. And it's just nice even just realising what's in your garden or what's locally. And I think connecting people with that as well really helps because um, then they can actually see what you're going to make an impact on and that definitely helps kind of bring about the bigger issues that maybe you'd like them to help out on so really key yeah and I'll just add quickly um similar to Nia um, a lot of people don't know about peatlands and it's sort of out of sight out of mind and it's um something that we've tried to work on recently um because yeah we can do all the restoring we like but if people don't care about it then it's it's not it's not achieving all our goals so um yeah lots of sharing on social media and our website and lots more videos and stuff and um i've oh and yeah just yeah just talking to people i know that i've influenced like my family people didn't my friends didn't know what pete was before so just sharing that kind of knowledge but it but yeah it is a challenge for sure Uh, would you add anything, Lizzie? 
I am. I, th I think people have covered it very well, but I think just your own excitement and your own passion, that passion is infectious, that if you get really excited about something and you're showing it to them, that that, that then sparks something. They go, oh, well, why are they so interested? Why is this so important? And then they start thinking it through. And um, so, so, yeah, just be the change you want to see in others. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, Dakota, would you like to unmute and ask a question or you know, make your statement? Yeah, um, I wanted to ask Rosie a question. Um, I actually do know about Pete, but I am shocked about how many people have absolutely no idea, no idea about it. I mean, to be honest, I didn't until I started working on a project related to it. And it's just, I, I love Pete so much and I love peatland conservation, but um, I've only really studied it a lot in the context of Northern Ireland, which is where I'm from. Um, and then sometimes looking at Scottish examples because there's so much research done up there. But I was wondering what the main causes of sort of damage and drainage to peat is in Yorkshire, because I know in Northern Ireland, a lot of it would be forestry. Um, a lot of it would be agriculture, but less sort of burning on um, sort of game reserves and things like that. That wouldn't be as much of an issue here. But um, I was just wondering how that's different um, in the area you work in. Yeah, cool. It's awesome that um, you know about it. Um, <laughs> welcome to the welcome to the world. Um, yeah, in Yorkshire we have um, different challenges, but they have similar effects. So all all causing the sort of um, degradation of the peat. So in in Yorkshire it's it's mainly man-made again, um, but often from drainage. So back after the Second World War, war farmers were paid to. Um, drain the peatlands to increase grazing for um, sheep so to try and make the land more profitable because it was just thought that this was a wasteland and nothing it was useless and um, we needed to drain it and farm it um, hindsight's a great thing we now know about all the amazing things that peat peatlands do for us so we're now <laughs> talking to those farmers and saying please can you fill in those drains that you dug um, we also have some some wildfire issues um it's it's just anything that causes the sphagnum to die um so so yeah as soon as the water table drops usually like i say from the draining um and yeah we do have um a lot of yorkshire um particularly in the uplands is managed for grouse moors um and they uh, manage the moorland for um, using rotational burning um, to manage the heather um, and that often has negative impacts sometimes it's it can work in harmony but often has negative impacts on the peatlands so yeah different different challenges but similar consequences thank you i've heard some pretty problematic things about driven grouse shooting. Uh, anyway, we've got a question in the chat from uh, Katie Lilly. Um, what's the best way that you have found to encourage uh, young people to get involved, speakers? Sorry, Lawrence, did you say it was for me? I didn't quite catch my thing broke up one way moment there. So what's the best way that you've found to encourage young people to get involved? Would you like to start, Lizzie? Okay, yes. Um, so... We've worked quite a lot with some of the local schools and built up really good relationships with um, the, the young people through that. We often use like the John Muir Award, um, which gets them out over a long period of time, sort of looking at different elements of exploring and conserving and, and sharing. So um, the sort of often the initial character, they get some proper accreditation, um, but then actually when they get out there, they just discover that actually this nature is amazing and it's just on their doorstep and it often leads them to thoughts about well actually this could be an interesting job an interesting career what what else could could i do here so um starting off small and then um seeing where it leads yeah i've done the john muir road through the Shropshire wildlife trust it's a brilliant program um should we come to nia next yeah so we we work with with quite a lot of young people through um well the Actually, it's a, a it was a our bright future project. It's called our World Coast, um, and that's um, moved on now to being called Stand for Nature. Um, and one of the key things that we were trying to do through both those projects, or 
uh, and working with young people in general is putting young people in the lead um, and asking um, what what they want rather than um, a, a, rather than sort of just giving uh, young people stuff to do because that you know particularly you know uh, older people might not have they have totally different views and um, different ways of thinking and so it's for, the big thing for us is asking young people what they want and how they want it and their opinions and what they think and we found that um, by doing that our Wild Coast for example is the one of the most successful projects we've run um, in the trust for a very long time and that is because it was led by young people um, so yeah I would say ask ask opinions and to get young people in the lead. That sounds like very good advice. Um, should we move to Rosie? Um, yeah, I think Yorkshire Wildlife Trust had an Our Bright Future project as well called um, Tomorrow's Natural Leaders, which I think sounds similar to Nia's where they were um, leading on projects and um, deciding what they wanted to do and stuff. Um, Peatlands is quite tricky because particularly where we are in Yorkshire the access is really difficult so it's physically quite hard to get people up there like we need four by fours and um, it can take half a day to hike up to the site so it's it's quite difficult generally but um, we're trying to do more events um, like bringing the bog down to people and showing people what it's about um, trying to do more on social media and um, reach reach younger audiences and then doing bits and pieces in schools um we'd like to do more um get into more schools and um you know get p, p on the uh, curriculum and things just so people are more aware of it um but yeah it's, it's much more of a challenge for us just with the remoteness of the sites it does seem like it, it does seem like a challenge but it sounds like you know how to address it uh, now uh marianne Thanks, Lawrence. Um, yeah, so it was a project. Um, I actually ran a school engagement program for primary schools. I work really closely with um, Loch Lomond and the Trossachs National Park. So they've got a really good education team and they're always bringing kind of local schools out into the park to actually kind of do things with nature. So I helped with some squirrely bits on that one. Um, and actually, as part of the Scottish Wildlife Trust, there's... Um, there's quite a lot of youth engagement. So both the National Park and the Wildlife Trust have um, youth leaders and youth groups and forums so that they've actually got quite a key part in how those organisations run, which is great. They've both started up in the past couple of years um, and also really encouraging kind of people to get involved. Um, not always as volunteers. It can be a bit tricky depending on what you're doing because some of our sites are a bit remote as well. You wouldn't normally think it, um, but a few of them are. And but um, the Wildlife Trust also has wildlife watch groups, so go into a particular area and try and kind of get everyone really excited about nature in all sorts of ways, not just squirrels. So, yeah, just kind of key to keep engaging with people. Um, and then we do a lot on social media. Obviously, COVID caused a few issues, so we've done a lot of kind of tools to try and do things online um, with videos and YouTubes and also kind of got some activities that younger kids can do as well. That sounds great. Thank you very much. Okay, um, we've got a question in the chat, um, because how did you get into your careers and what barriers did you face? Um, should we come back to Lizzie to start off with? Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so I probably took quite an academic route. I went to university and studied environmental biology and um, then I went on did a PhD and um, sort of focused in more on grasslands and agronomy and all those kind of things. And um, then for me that I sort of stepped back and went, well, actually, what is it I want to do? And my initial passion was always about like telling others and getting other people excited about nature. So then I looked into what jobs there were in the sort of environmental sector in Northern Ireland and did a bit of volunteering and things to try and get some more relevant experience and was very fortunate to get a job with the Belfast Hills Partnership. And as I said, 16 years later, I sort of bopped around the organisation and done different roles, but I'm, I'm currently the scheme manager there. Thank you very much. Um, Nia? Um, yeah, so I've been very lucky to have worked um, at the Wildlife Trust, Northwest Wildlife Trust since 2007. Um, the way 
that I got into it all actually was when I started university, there was a local branch of the Marine Conservation Society started up um, and it was started up by a few of my friends at university. Um, so I got involved in that and we were going out, you know, socially, we'd go to watch for harbour porpoises and we started doing school events and um, educational events and then we took over um, a couple of the kiosks on the pier in Bangor and changed them into marine education centres so this it was a completely voluntary group of people um, and mostly students at the time and then um, we eventually broke off from being a um, local branch of the Marine Conservation Society to being a organisation on our own um, and so that was back in 2000 and 2003-2004 so it's just something I was doing for fun um, and we were all volunteers and then we found some funding to employ a marine education officer um, which we did and they left their post um, and we I ended up filling that post while I was doing my master's and um, and when I finished my master's they asked if you know I'd take it on full time so I did um, but by 2007 we'd kind of got a bit too big to be run by volunteers so I was the only employed person and the wildlife trust were looking to do um, more marine stuff so it made sense that we became part of the wildlife trust and um, so I kind of I was lucky to get my job you know that way by sort of being transferred over from a different group really and I've, I've been there ever since so I've been you know extremely lucky but so managed to get a job by um you know just doing what I love really so very I'm um, yeah extremely lucky that was a wonderful story isn't it? um should we move on to Rosie yeah that was a great story Nia I love that <laughs> um so I, I also went to university, I did zoology, um, didn't really like conservation at uni, um, but then um, took a year out and sort of tried to figure out what I wanted to do and then uh, ended up doing a traineeship with Yorkshire Wildlife Trust. So I'd really recommend looking at traineeships. I think most wildlife trusts do them. They're really, really great in, uh, introductions. Um, Cause yeah, I won't lie the, it's it was hard to get into conservation. I applied for many, many, many jobs after my traineeship and just happened to get a peatland one. I didn't even really know that much about peat. Um, assistance roles are few and far between I found um, so within Yorkshire Wildlife Trust and um, we're trying to change that and and make more assistant roles available and also um, change uh, job descriptions so things like you don't need a university degree anymore um, volunteering is is immensely helpful if you have the time and uh, are able to do that um, because most jobs say, yeah, well, um, experience. But of course, if it's your first job, that's quite hard to come by. So if you can do a traineeship or, or volunteer, then I'd say that was the best way, best way in probably. OK, thank you very much. And uh, finally, we'll come to Marianne. Uh, mine's a little bit complicated, um, but kind of similar so um I decided before I wanted went to uni I wanted to travel and so I went to the waitress and saved up money so I could go and work at a wildlife rehab center in South Africa um and that kind of gave me a bit more of the bug that I wanted to work with animals um I desperately desperately wanted to work with big cats um on safari and I never did um apart from the wildlife center and it's partly because I realized that I'd never be able to handle anything like I'd put like a GPS collar on or I'd look at binoculars at them from a distance but I wouldn't actually get to kind of be hands-on and that's really what I wanted to do so I then went to uni um, did biology and psychology because I couldn't choose which one I wanted to do I also did a master's in conservation and kind of after that and in between I um, did lots of volunteering but mainly for research projects so I kind of bounced around the world quite a bit and um, doing all sorts in all sorts of places and then I'd come home and kind of stay with my parents for six months and go oh, I don't have a job I'm really sorry I'll find one soon um, and they eventually attempted to do two PhDs but didn't finish either of them um, for various reasons and then decided I didn't really want to be in academia anymore I didn't want to write a paper and kind of it's go on a shelf and no one to look at it I wanted to be on the ground and do things um, so I came back to the UK 
uh, again living with my parents um, I worked in Aldi grocery stores for a while trying to volunteer and doing other bits in the UK and I actually applied to come and work with the Red Squirrel project five different times and finally got in on the fifth try um, for exactly the same position but in different regions and part of it was because I didn't know the areas and everybody else kind of knew them a bit more. Um, I've now been with the project for five years and very glad I kept going but um, yeah volunteering is definitely the way to go if you can and I suggest even if it's just once every so often like it doesn't have to be every week it doesn't have to be every month just like occasionally or if someone says can I have a hand with this just make sure you mention it on a CV when you're applying for stuff um, but yeah I've kind of bumbled my way through and I didn't really have a plan um, and it's all kind of fallen into place so I'd just say if you kind of if something grabs you and goes actually I fancy doing that just give it a try and if it doesn't work out that's fine um, at least you know what you don't want to do then so yeah that's it Thank you. That makes me feel uh, a lot better about not really having a plan myself. <laughs> uh, right then, and I would say that although the I would say that although the, uh, the world does need academic scientists, of course, as um, speakers have all hinted at, you um, you don't need necessarily to have a degree or academic qualifications to work in conservation because a lot of it's practical. Okay, um, so thank you to the speakers. Thank you to everyone who asked questions. I'll now hand you back to Naomi. Thank you. So we've just got like a quick poll to share with you with the uh, three short questions just to reflect on the session. So if Lydia wants to launch that. yeah. So the first question is, what did you think of the session? And there's uh, a few multiple choice answers. And then there's, um, did you learn anything new from the session? And will you take positive action to help the environment if you haven't already? So I'll just give you a second to fill that in. I'm at 57% at the moment. I'm not sure if it's because, oh no, it's gone up a bit more. I'm at 78%. I'm not sure if it's because I haven't voted or if they need to vote. I can't actually vote, so that doesn't help. Or if the speakers want to vote, they can vote for themselves as well. <laughs> That's completely okay. And you, yourself and Lawrence can vote as well if you want to. I haven't done it, Lydia, and I've now closed it. So if you don't oh, get that's okay. 100, that's why. <laughs> <right. laughs> that's all right. Um, I might stop and share it now. So I'm going to stop the polling now and I will share the results on screen. Okay, so if you've got like any extra comments, uh, you can raise your hand or um, write them in the chat now. So I'll just close now. So thank you all for attending. Don't forget to like keep up to date with future updates about our right future in the Wildlife Trust on social media. So I'd like to thank all the presenters, Rosie, Mia, Lizzie and Mary Ann and all of you who attended tonight. Please feel free and I encourage you to follow our right future on social media channels and sign up to the newsletter to hear about events and like opportunities which may be applicable to you. I hope you've all enjoyed the evening and bye for now.